Sonic Technology with Jeffrey Appling. You're listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Everts Plateau. And uh, this is a special episode. I know we're in the middle of a book report, but right now, when you're listening to this, probably, well, maybe, depends on when you're listening to it, but <laughs> if you're listening to this right when we publish it, we're out of town. So we actually had to record this episode a week before. So this is actually the night after we recorded the last book report. And uh, But this is a very special episode because we have joining us Jeffrey Appling of Appling Jewelry. And we've actually mentioned this guy and his work quite a few times on our podcast about sonic drilling into stone. And because we were looking at his website and he does this beautiful work. So Jeffrey, thanks so much for coming on the show. And, I, and uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Oh, heck, thank you guys so much. It's a pleasure. So I really appreciate it. I look forward to uh, the next couple hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and somebody from the Discord or in the comments section turned us on to uh, his blog, right? Or an right? email or something. I yeah. can't remember. Who, yes. Do you remember who it was? No, no. It was an, an alert listener. <laughs> <laughs> That's We're wonderful. Gonna, yeah. We have to dig around and figure out who it was, right? Yeah. Jeffrey, we got to find out who that person was. Yes, yes. I have a gift for them. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll figure out who it was then. Yeah, whoever you were, speak up, and we'll know if you're lying. <laughs> now they're all going to speak up because they know there's a no, present. No, we know. <laughs> we will know. <laughs> we trust our listeners that's out there. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. As far as we can throw them, which is not very far. All right. <laughs> so what do you got? We're, we're not going to do Space for the News because it's actually not the – it won't be Space for the News for the right week. And uh, I was going to do a crypto update, but that also won't be the right crypto numbers. So just not worry about that. We'll, okay, we'll yeah. just go with what Kyle's got. Well, I have a uh, story that was in my feed for a while. Let's see, about six days. Um, but this is from our good buddy Phil Plate over at Bad Astronomy. Ah, oh, yes. And uh, it's about the zodiacal light. Um, it's kind All of right. a long story, but I, I found it pretty good. So <clears throat> Mars may be sneezing out dust into the solar system that's visible from Earth. So Phil writes, if you go outside at night in a dark spot with no moonlight, you may spot a faint glow in the sky that follows the zodiac constellations. This glow is called the zodiacal light and is caused by tiny particles of dust orbiting the sun outside Earth's orbit. They faintly reflect sunlight back to us, generally barely visible by eye, though obvious enough in photos. What's not obvious is the source of dust. Um, it was once thought to be from asteroids, big rocks in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter sometimes collide, and the dust generated in such an impact would spread out and create the zodiacal glow. Later research indicated that instead, of, instead it was coming from what are called Jupiter family comets, which are comets with yeah. short periods. They came from deeper out in the solar system, past Jupiter, and its mighty gravity swung them down close to the sun. When they warm up, they shed ice and dust, and that dust is what makes zodiacal light. Zodiacal light, uh, oh wait, that's a caption. But wait, a paper just published has turned this all on its head and found that the most likely source of the zod zodiacal dust is Mars. Hmm. What do you think about that? That's interesting. <laughs> So Phil says, that's pretty weird, and to be honest, I'm not 100% convinced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See? All right. He's being a good scripture. He's being card. the right kind of scripture. <laughs> okay, good. But the findings are very interesting. Even better, they come from a mission to Jupiter. The Juno space uh, spacecraft launched from Earth in 2011. It took a circuitous route to Jupiter, first making a big elliptical loop into the asteroid belt and then back down to Earth. It passed our fair world which gave Juno a gravity assist boost, flinging it out towards Jupiter. It arrived at the gas giant in 2016 and has been orbiting the planet ever since. Many missions sent to other planets have a dust detector on them to sense when the spacecraft is impacted by interplanetary particles. Juno, however, does not. Not an official one, at least. What it does have are three very large solar panels totaling an area of 60 square meters, they're big to compensate for diminishing sunlight at Jupiter's orbit, which is only about 4% as strong as it is at Earth. 
the solar panels present a big target for dust impacts. Actually, over a thousand times the size uh, dust detectors usually are. A typical dust particle will hit the panels at about 5 kilometers per second, or 18,000 kilometers per hour. Even a tiny particle weighing in at 15 nanograms will cause a tiny piece of the panel to get blasted off, what scientists call spallation. Okay, great. But how do you detect that? This is where some fun serendipity comes in. There are four cameras mounted on Juno that track stars used for spacecraft orientation. One of these cameras was left on during the cruise stage of Juno's flight to Jupiter in the hopes of catching an undiscovered asteroid or two on the way. What it found were over 15,000 streaks in the sky due to bits of interplanetary debris slamming into the solar panel and spalling out, uh, spallating off bits of them. So another, yeah, you get yeah. Yeah, Okay. The camera caught all of the solar panels being nailed by dust. Mm -hmm. The scientists knew what, what these were because the spacecraft spins for stabilization. So in the images, it looks like the uh, spallated bits are spiraling away. Very cool. When scientists on Earth analyzed the data, they found that the impacts occurred for the most part between the orbit of Earth and a distance about twice that from the sun. They saw fewer occurring when Juno was in the asteroid belt, implying that asteroids actually soak up the particles somehow. Earth does as well, clearing them away from its orbit. Mars, however, is too small to do that, which is strange. Yeah. If, if asteroids can do it, why, can, why can't Mars? I don't know. But in farther out than 300 million kilometers, Jupiter's gravity clears the orbits of particles as well. This strongly implies that the source of the dust is between those distances, and the only source they could think of that fits all that that fits that bill is Mars, which orbits about 220 million kilometers from the sun. To see if this made sense, they took their observations of the dust and created a computer model of how dust would behave if it came from <laughs> Mars. What they found seems to fit the observed zodiacal light behavior pretty well. That's bizarre. With all those obvious possible sources, asteroids and comets, why would Mars be the font of this material? To be frank, they don't know. The scientists write that they don't understand how Mars could do this. Its escape velocity is too high for dust from the surface to escape into space. It's easier to get dust from impacts on its two small moons, Phobos and Deimos. But even then, they orbit close enough to Mars that getting dust into interplanetary space from them is very difficult. The researchers are hoping other scientists can help them figure it out. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, the only source of that dust could be impacts, right? Something that could throw it back out into space. Exactly. It's coming from Mars. So impacts he's, can he's, do it. He's skeptical because it's more likely to be comet cometary. But yeah. 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 Hmm. He goes on to say, uh, to be honest, that's a big reason I'm skeptical. For one thing, comets are such an obvious source, and the number of them we see are enough to make the dust uh, that is observed. And yeah. since there's no understood mechanism of getting dust from Mars, well, that's a decent reason to be skeptical. But that doesn't mean the scientists are wrong. Their models do seem to make a good prediction of dust behavior, so it would be wrong to dismiss the idea. I think reserving judgment for now is prudent, at least until a generation mechanism uh, is found. But keeping an open mind is best at the moment. Still, this is a fascinating idea. And what gets me more is the method they use to find all this, a series of happy engineering design accidents that resulted in some pretty good data and a very surprising result. It makes me hope that future missions to the outer solar system set up something similar so that we can get more data. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, first learning about the zodiacal light from the um, episode, did, yeah, episode we did with Martin Sweatman. Yeah. Yeah, and I think he was he included it in there because it seems to be leftovers from cometary debris. That's right. And some people were possibly even, something the that torrids. Yes, something yeah. that people witnessed. The people of Gubekli Tepe. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, that's a good article. I mean, good buddy Phil Plate <laughs> doing a good job there. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, anything else, or should we? Should we start talking about sonic drilling? I want to get into it, man. Yeah. All right, Jeffrey. 
So well, I'm here. I'm ready. All right. So let's first let's go ahead and uh, let, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself and how you got into this and and maybe give them a primer on what we're going to be talking about. Oh, okay. Um, so. Um, Basically, I'm a gemologist, a gemologist and a jewelry designer, and uh, I've faceted gemstones before, and I kind of worked in the jewelry industry in many different levels, uh, also as a, um, a, a due diligent professional unbiased appraiser, uh, was an expert witness in a court of law. But um, it was mainly the fabrication of uh, metals and seeing gemstones and how they work that always fascinated me. So I became an award-winning jewelry designer with some of my art. And around 2017, I was watching a video and I became aware of all this stuff around the world that uh, was like advanced technology. I never knew any of that stuff. You know, I'm just told what I was taught in school. Yeah. And uh, when I started looking at this, I started, you know, trying to figure out how do you do this? And then certain things kind of came to me about my past history in jewelry is I saw someone doing a sonic hole. And it was real tiny, but at least I knew that was available. And then when I was doing more research and I found out everyone always places sound to be alongside, even the old text, they say something with sound is always resonating through all this. So I focused on the sound and then um, uh, I finally found a machine to do it. They sell them. I got it home and I was able to do my first sonic core hole and uh, it was amazing. And after that, it was about just changing the bottom tool to make it geometric. And that's basically it. And uh, today, now just understanding the technology uh, that was done so long ago, I'm able to look at things differently today. I can see you start, everything changes. Once you get the machine, you're going to get a whole feel for how things work. It's amazing. Mm. Yeah, I remember looking at these. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I keep mentioning your blog post because that's where I saw it. Uh, yeah, that was the link somebody gave us. Yeah, somebody gave link, us the yeah. link, and it was just, uh -huh. it was totally obvious. Like, <laughs> yeah. you're, you show the pictures of the unfinished obelisk. Look at these scoop marks. Hey, check it out. I can make the same thing yeah. on granite. Mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> I'm just like, wow. Yeah. Now, now yeah, one there thing would be a correction, though, on the, uh, the scoops under the unfinished obelisk. If you notice, right underneath it, it's got a curve. Like, someone took a bucket and just scooped it. You can't do that with a, a straight tube. So that's right. Um, I do think they could have used some sonic uh, technology and that whole area around the obelisk would have been filled with water. And then, of course, the grit and then somehow some type of mechanism to go in there and do whatever. But so, it doesn't look like it was done with a straight tube. Do you think so. this technology can scale up to that size? See, I'm not a scientist, so I'm thinking, you know, like it's just like everyone studies the universe. And then there's people that study small things. Well, Big things are made of little things, so yeah, you can definitely size it up, but you would need... I think we do some of that technology today in just drilling um, yeah, I, like I, into the ground. Yeah, so. I, I, I agree. I was just wondering because one, one thing that happens with us, you know, we talk about this quite a bit on the podcast, is one thing that doesn't scale up very well, or at least not linearly, is moving massive weight. Right. People, mm. somebody will demonstrate moving a one ton block around and then think that they have demonstrated how somebody could move a hundred ton block around. And it's just not true. Materials begin to fail at those larger masses that you can mm -hmm. use in a smaller mass. But I don't I'm not sure I don't that probably wouldn't happen in the same way with this. But I still think there would be probably there would be scaling issues, but they can probably be overcome. Yeah. And I'm wondering, yeah. too, is if like what you've the work you've been doing, like you're saying, you're doing straight drilling. Um can you imagine just from your experience with it there's that, that there could be a way to make a tool that can go around corners and continue? Is that possible? Because, I mean, it's well, not that's like... that's what I want. That's When I saw that, that, that's another thing I'll try to figure out. Too. <laughs> All right. So, oh, no, I'm on this. I'm looking at zero-point gravity, everything. And right. metaphysical, how do I actually make heels? Instead of talking about how they heal people, I want to show how it works. Oh, wow. Heck yeah. Yeah. All yeah, right. I, it seems like with sonic drilling you should be able to go around corners like the 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 problem with you know rotating drills is you have to have a material that can that can bend and also rotate it yeah. just, that's that becomes difficult right and that can cut it has to be able to spin yeah. and bend and cut yeah so why why don't you tell us the process like how does this how does the machine exactly work 
Like, what are we looking at here? I can pull up this. Uh, okay. Yeah. So um, I had shown you a picture of it. And, um, well, uh, on the back, on the top inside, there's a um, quartz. And I think you've talked about piezoelectricity, which I forget what it is, vibrates 32,768 times per second or something like that. And um, that then you have a transducer on the top that um, – uh, creates a vibration and it goes down to a uh, metal uh, horn and then um, then you have your tool underneath that and um, basically you have an ampage and a frequency and you adjust that and basically uh, you have a grit that comes down so uh, basically what you want to imagine is imagine a metal tube right yeah and then your hard rock below it in between that you're going to have an abrasive slurry, uh, which has a hard, like a, a hard um, uh, grit in it, like a silicon carbide, and then that vibration. So the tube is not like a jackhammer; it's not going up and down. We're not like making explosions into it. Imagine the tube like a um, um, a tuning fork. You know how they vibrate back and forth. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, imagine the tube doing the same thing, but instead of uh, the tube scratching the stone, it's scratching the abrasive between the tool and the stone. Yeah. So it's kind of like sweeping. Imagine sweeping super fast or sandpaper, uh, instead like karate kid, instead of up and down, like a jackhammer, like paint the fence. It's more like sand the floor, back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> All right. And that's what you're doing. You're sliding back and forth. And it's, uh, that abrasive is just cutting right through any brittle material. And it could be a very hard material or a very soft material, even like pearl. Yeah. So you have pictures here of where you've cord into pearl it, oh yeah yeah right it, so we have shapes. the transducer um and then the cone the screw that holds the horn and then the tool down below i use uh on this machine you can go um a 0.8 millimeter round or you can go up to a six millimeter round tube ah. And they always say, you know, use steel. Someone on YouTube asked, well, have you ever tried brass? And I tried uh, uh, brass and it worked. So uh, bronze will work. My idea is the scraping back and forth on a steel tube. Steel is harder than copper. But on a copper tube, I thought the tool would disintegrate so fast that you wouldn't be able to properly do a uh, round hole in granite. So I I do have a picture on there, and it shows the actual copper tube drilling that. So copper will work. It will go right through granite. You don't need steel. Wow. Yeah. Okay, this is the picture of the copper tube? Yes, right? Wow. (laughs) Did it so... But did it abrade the copper down at all? No. And wow. that's what I was, I'm so happy someone asked me that question. So I just yeah. went out in the garage and, and did it. And I'm like, man, it hardly, it was almost like, just like the steel. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. So it's just agitating that, that grit really. Right. The, the copper is the mechanism to do that. It's not actually having to do most of the cutting work. That's amazing. Right. So it's, it's just pushing the abrasive down as it's grinding back and forth and creating a protrusion into the aggregate. Yeah. So I want to know about the frequency you have to, do you have to tweak the frequency before, like for each different stone you're trying to cut into? Yeah, I was going to ask. No, that. not, not at all. So, um, there's adjustments on the machine and, um, it'll have an amp and a frequency and you usually want to go half amp and then, um, you get it up to say, uh, 19,000 Hertz and the dials there, you do everything. I do it manually and you start getting a feel for it. And it just starts, uh, once the water and the grit comes down and the action happens, man, you're going through it really fast. I mean, not real fast, but, um, uh, let's say with a diamond impregnated core drill bit and a, a speed drill, you might go through one inch of, uh, granite, with the six millimeter tube, probably take you maybe 15 minutes or so. With sonic technology, it could take, if you have it uh, perfected just right, the amp and the frequency, you can go through it in less than a minute. Wow. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's awesome. That's amazing. And that's through quartz. You have three different minerals in the uh, uh, yeah. granite. You have quartz, which is seven, and I guess you know mica, two and a half, and then feldspar, probably five at point five. Five, right, yeah. So this is, are you able to, um, to work the surface of the stone, like say with an edge of the tube without having, having to put it face down on it? Yeah. I tried that too. That's a great question. It works. Yeah. 
you can just like do a uh, scoop right off the side. Wow. Man. Yeah. All right. So let's... that's why I'm so excited for you guys to get one. So yeah, let's back <laughs> so up. Someone that. else can share this. It's amazing. How much do these babies cost? Yeah. What are we? Okay. Are we I paid 1900. Right. Hey, that's not bad. Hey. And that included the horns and everything. They give you a little torch. You don't have to be, you don't it really, you can be a novice and do this. And by doing this, you're going to do what no jade carver in China can do. You're going to do what no gem cutter in America or even in Eider Oberstein, Germany can do. It's, wow. Th- you're going to be putting yourself light years ahead of everyone. I'm so, I'm amazed that this isn't utilized more. I was like, when we were looking that at at the stuff yeah. you've you've done. I'm just like, why do have we not seen yeah, this? Yeah, why aren't people doing this? Right. <laughs> yeah. So what were you wanting? To I do? was just saying, let's back up to the beginning of the pictures. Let's talk okay. about everything we got here. So, yeah, you sent us a bunch of pictures. So let's go through some of these. What are we looking at? I think I've seen this hole before, but what are we looking at here? Oh yes, this hole. So after when I was looking at pictures, the thing is, I'm not a real traveler. So you really need to be able to have it with you uh, in your presence to really do a full analysis. Yeah. So I'm just going off pictures. And when I saw Egypt, I saw square holes and round holes. And then uh, I came across this image and it was some some article. It was in Norway. It's called the Volda Star. And um, apparently they were excavating in some backyard and they had an excavator and they were digging deep. I mean, like 20 feet down and they broke open a rock. And within the rock was a perfect geometric hole going like uh, quite a few feet. Yeah. And I mean, that was buried deep underground. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, sonic technology. Yeah. Because I was doing the same thing, but in different shape. So now we have like that seven. was in Norway, and you can find it online. And then we have star holes in Massachusetts, California, and quite a few other areas. And here we go. That's the one from Massachusetts, Monson. I think it's called the Flint Quarry Mine. And yeah, so um, basically, to get that shape, we run a round tube through what we call a draw plate. And the draw plate is a metal. Um, Piece and it has the shape of a star and you just pound that tube right through that shape and it gives you a star tube uh, from there you do your vibration and you just go right through the stone so depending on how good of the tool maker is will determine how good the hole is right so if i made a horrible shape it'll cut an ugly shape <laughs> i see and that that's that i mean based on that measurement there is what is that two two inches across two a little over two inches at the widest point doesn't that say? Yeah, I, yeah, I, that's what it looks I think like. the capabilities of what I've seen so far, like Norway and this, the largest they get is like uh, seven centimeters. So yeah. that's about that. Yeah. So they all seem to have similar uh, diameters. Hmm. And then we and have there's this. a right here. That is a cog stone. These came up. They were washed and found in Santa Ana and they're all like clumped together and then scattered out in the field like a big like tsunami came and just flushed them all down what? and no one could figure them out. And they say, oh, yeah, the natives, they made uh, they were trying to explain cactus, a slice of cactus, what it looks like and stuff like that. And, I, you know, I have no proof of how those are made, but that one in front of us is granite. Yeah, yeah, and and that's it like looks it's a, a lot like the uh, star hole uh, void in uh, from Volta. Yeah, this um, one's an eight pointed star, and the one from from Volva is it called seven seven mm-hmm. pointed star? Volta. Norway. Yeah, yeah, Norway. The the one from Massachusetts is a five pointed star, but the, yeah. but this one we're looking at the Cog Sea Star. This is the core. This is the core. Yeah, the core. Piece. That's what I'm thinking. I have no proof, but what I'm thinking is, you know how when we drill these geometrics, uh, geometric hole, you have a geometric tube from the inside of the so if you slice that core you get a bunch of cogged stones which these are considered i'm thinking i, I have yeah. no proof of that uh-huh. right so like you pull a core out and then you cut it in slices and then you end up with a bunch of these yeah things. yeah because i was doing it myself uh-huh. <laughs> that's pretty awesome <laughs> i'm like oh yeah i do that i've done this before. that's what i was saying i was just imagining you when i was looking at that blog i'm like this guy's just working on his jewelry and then he starts looking into ancient stuff and he's all these people are wondering how do they he's like oh yeah i did that yesterday uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah i do that in my garage guys it's the deal <laughs> it's so awesome. it's easy yeah <laughs> um okay so the next one is yeah, we're starting to look at at some of these cores what is this this is okay like so that's granite. your uh, red granite from aswan mm-hmm. uh so you um basically it looks like a sonic core yeah. um that's the one i think uh, that's talked about a lot i've seen on i got that off the internet 
Um, it just looks, it also looks so familiar to there's, uh, the cave de Cusa where the lady's standing right in the cleft of, or the edge of the tube. Oh yeah. Those giant um, ones. Well, this one's interesting cause they've, they've got, it looks like they've got the handle of a file in there showing the taper. As, so you've got the, you got the core itself, which would be inside the cutting tube. And then you have the, 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 the drill hole, which is the outside, outside mm-hmm. of the cutting tube. So it's showing that the that it tapers down, right? As it right. gets deeper. Good point. Do you see and you're this in your work that in sonic hole cores and okay. also in the cores itself? It's bigger uh, when you're going in because remember, the deeper you bring that tube in, and it's remember, it's it's going back and forth. It's sweeping back and forth. Well, the uh, the point of contact, the deeper you go in, the less movement. It's getting um, smaller uh. as you go through. Uh, it, gets it can't finer. vibrate as much. So it's not actually right. Thank you. So yeah. so when you look at the tube, your your work tool at afterwards, you're not noticing that gigantic taper. It's just that the end of it is not yep. able to vibrate as much as it's still pushing correct. the slurry down, Holy but it can't crap. vibrate back and forth too much. So this ah okay that that's a that big makes mystery so solved. much sense. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mystery solved. Next mystery. <laughs> next mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Next. <laughs> Yeah, so I've seen oh, this picture yeah. before. This is Egypt too, right? This is a uh, right. Yeah. This is uh, th- what the first picture I think I saw, and then on one of your podcasts I saw. Um, is it Ben from um, Uncharted yes. X? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would see from. That's why it's really hard. You need to examine these in person. So right. this one kind of freaked me out. I understand the tube going into it and leaving uh, the mark where the finger is, but there's a um, a line before the hole yes. and uh when ben was moving his camera over i was able yeah thank you i was yeah. able to see oh they rested the tube there and then they turned and went in uh, so uh, okay. now that makes more sense so it really you need to see all angles you yes. can't just go by a picture right it's really hard yeah I, I thought for a while i was like did they use a bigger tube and then they made a smaller one to go farther in is that kind of what you're yeah. talking about yeah that's it's uh, it's interesting and that that one's huge. Or are you if, yeah, if you stop? Yeah, I think Ben was saying maybe um, eight or nine inches. Yeah, so that's like the that's biggest huge. one that's known. Yeah. So if you stop yeah. advancing the tool through the stone, but it's still vibrating, will it just continue to waller out the hole and make it wider and wider? Like for at least for a time. Is that what you mean by he rested the tube there on this on this oh, ledge? Yeah, like at a different angle. So before you're gonna go straight into that hole, imagine moving the tube more towards you and it just rested on there before they started drilling. Okay. It's just like a that's me doing a, a lazy before you know, I accidentally if you touch a stone, it's gonna vibrate anywhere you touch that tube. So it's starting to cut whether you're advancing the tool or not. Mm. Yeah. Huh. Oh, exactly. It, well, if it touches anything, it'll uh, scrape it, like sweep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, and these, we need to find a, a I want to get a higher res image of this. Yeah, we got to get a bigger picture of that. We're, so mm-hmm. we're looking down, this is a top-down view of, of in this image, because it's so small, uh, the image is small, but they look like little drill cores sticking up. But then you can see that there's a person laying down, and they're not even as tall as the diameter of one of the drill cores. It's huge. And where is this located? Mm-hmm. This is a cave de Cusa, I believe in Sicily. And there it's limestone. And I came across this on the internet and I looked at it and um, I thought, wow, I, I was a little bit jealous. I thought someone beat me to the punch with the sonic drilling. And then I opened up the page and I said, what's all that green stuff? You know? <laughs> yeah. And then I saw, it's, what is that a person? It's and it trees. blew me away. I'm like, that's a core <laughs> sample. Yeah. Those are cores. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty wild. And Those then, are big, big tubes that make that. That is huge. That's well, I have no proof of that. I'm just saying it looks very similar to what I'm doing. It does doing. look similar. And, like, um, you know, what I, I wonder if they have a standard model explanation of how these were cut. Yeah, we're going to have to look. We can yeah. look this up in the break. Yeah. Um, yeah, they said that they uh, hand chiseled it. They walked around it and made everything perfect. Even the outside wall, which you wouldn't need. Right. They made that perfect. And they just, yeah. And then to get them out, they just uh, busted them over with ropes or something like that. And then to haul them off to make the giant uh, pillars, they rolled them on logs. Mm, okay. That's the explanation. All right. 
Yeah, I, I they chipped it out. <laughs> give, somebody hands you a chisel and says, "Go over to that giant boulder and carve me." A, yeah, and make the side wall smooth too. Right, and yeah, perfectly yeah. round. <laughs> Here's a step ladder. Yeah. Go. <laughs> right, and you only get a few feet to work in. Right. Yeah. That's incredible. That is oh amazing. My gosh. And that's something I've never seen any researcher look at or talk about. Yeah. But maybe they have. Well, we're going to have to look it up in the break and, yeah. and uh, maybe okay. we'll, maybe we'll talk about it a little more in the next segment because that is that's fascinating. I've never seen that. What time are we got anyway? What is um, it? Oh, we're at a break uh, yeah, time. A break ha! Time. time to do side right. research. A little research. All right. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, joined by Jeffrey Appling of Appling Jewelry. And uh, man, this is this is absolutely fascinating. Um, I really think there's something to this in terms of uh, a lot of these ancient sites that we've we've been studying, looking at pictures and videos of because we haven't been there yet. That's but right. um, yeah, so I also wanted to ask you um you know, after you've started looking into these things, or at least on the internet, like we do, uh, what do you think about some of the uh, stuff in in Peru where you see like the strange scoop marks and um, nubs and things sticking out of the walls? I think you even have a picture in here of. Um, I know this was not the purpose of your picture, but like some right. of these little scoops in these in these cyclopean walls, like. Uh, yeah, I have no idea um, how that's uh, created, but I figured if I start with the sonic, something will start resonating where I can start getting to that point. Yeah, but um, it's just amazing to me. Uh, gosh, it looks like the Hodgkinson effect, and then you get some like if you were to get a wire in Jello and just uh, kind of move that wire around, and then they could come apart. And uh, it's just amazing. I have yeah, no idea. Exactly. Yeah. It's, I really don't. But the surfaces of the stone are all worked Puppy. to a, a, a very uh, oh. homogenous sort of, uh, I don't know, rough pattern, right? Mm -hmm. Does that, you think that's maybe some of the same technology or is that? No. Know. Cause it could be, maybe I, if you had a giant machine, you could have larger grain sizes in your slurry. Oh, absolutely. That can happen too. Yeah. So there you go. Possibility. But usually you would do, you know, I would see cuts that are uh, a lot more straight at 90 degrees. You wouldn't see a puffy feel of it, even yeah. with a lot of uh, weathering and erosion. It just looks a lot different than sonic technology. So mm. maybe there's other things with sound that are uh, yeah. used with that. Yeah. Yeah, it's just interesting because, you know, we got we've uh, with Ben and of course just looking at images too, but uh we've gone through looking at a lot of these walls in Cusco. This this picture is has a little bit of it, but some of the blocks that you see in these walls have these long scoop marks that are that are taken out of them and even even um in some places in Peru uh it's in the native rock. Like they were just cutting shapes into the native rock like you know part of the mountain and they just like would start cutting these shapes into it and some sometimes it's long scoop marks um and it's it, i just you know we were just wondering if maybe they could do it with the same kind of technology i don't know if building the block walls is using the same kind of technology cutting those blocks but it's like they somebody was going along the fronts of those blocks with a tool and mm -hmm. making marks at them in them somehow so i don't know yeah i agree yeah, yeah that's I wish I had more info on that one yeah. for you, but a lot of the protrusions that you see can be done with, um, the sonic drill. So if you had a square that was solid and didn't, you can, um, so if your tube is not hollow, it's just solid. You'll just make the indentation without the ring at the very, ah, uh, okay. So yeah. All right. You can do a blunt, just blunt shape. Yeah. But Yeah. But if you look at the ones in like um, Puma Punku, those geometric, that's crazy. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so. So you could use a, a spoon or a chisel shaped tool bit 
as well? Like it, that's what I was thinking about. So yeah, for I a curve, like for a curve, you could possibly get like a spoon shape is curved. You might be able to cut mm-hmm. into and make some interesting curves, curved cuts. Huh. Yeah, I'm willing to use some of your spoons on that. I think we should borrow a spoon <laughs> from the hotel. From the hotel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, we jam it into the machine and turn it on and see what happens. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. But at these. least, yeah, we're confronting. We can see uh, some blocks are polygonal, having more than four sides. In yep. that, so that's important. Anytime you see that type of construction, it's not something we utilize today. We're right. brick and mortar type things. Yes, yes, absolutely. All right, we'll go back to it. Yeah, so you, you sent us this image. This is, uh, this is some hieroglyphs. It looks like it's in granite. They're cut out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so low relief. Uh, they're beautifully done. Right. It might be on an obelisk. <laughs> I know yeah, exactly I, I what this, this is one is now. And um, <laughs> when I first saw this, I, I thought, okay, that's uh, ultrasonic cameo making. You can do intaglio or in um, or cameo. Intaglio is where uh, it's an indentation, but when it's of high relief, that would be a cameo. Ah, okay. And when you see this perfect lines in there where the hand is, there's fingernails and all that stuff. You can't do that with a chisel. Yeah, it's just, you don't do that. Um, but the whole thing, if you made a metal stamp, you could carve it out of say a wax and then cast it into copper or uh, bronze, and then you vibrate it into the stone, it's going to be perfect and exact just like oh that my every gosh. single time. <laughs> so I would actually measure all the hieroglyphs and see if the stamps are similar or, how, you know, look at it in that direction. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so you make a metal stamp and then you use that to cut it in. That's... Mm-hmm. Yes. My mind explosion the, button is not working, <laughs> but I'm trying to use it. <laughs> I have a button. And then that when makes I see it, the images, that's not even like a vocabulary. I mean, I see something completely different. I see vibration. I see an owl. What do owls do? They triangulate. Um, that's how they find their food. And then there's just so much with the animals that it, it's a lot to do with nature and sound and and. It's the science that we don't do right uh, on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. It looks you, you have the owl, and then you have this right. You have the right frequency, and then you've got this tool, and then you can make these shapes holding the tool in your hand, and then you see how to be a lion. <laughs> I think that's what it says. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's my translation. Well, guys. okay, the lion can just mean awesome, right? Okay, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You like, learn okay. how to be awesome. Yeah, <laughs> have really long legs. <laughs> But it's funny, I see like uh, they have bees and the ones I, I would, if you really wanted to learn more about maybe Egypt and what was going on at that time, I would try to understand this stuff, the stuff that is made in stone that we can't do today. That's the stuff you follow, not primitive chipping and, and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, you have to focus on the, the people that actually did the work. Right. Yeah. So you have a box here around, you've, did you draw that, that square? That- oh, yeah, it was an accident, but oh, okay. I was going to blow that up because I love the fingernails and the detail. And it's oh, like, right. oh, we got to copy that. Yeah. Okay, so in the next then, image. Like, animals have dew claws, and then the other animals, like a bee. And they're always saying, oh, the, the Egyptians love honey and all this stuff. But, you know, what, what do bees do? Bees don't fly. They levitate. They create a toroidal field around them, and they move around. Mm-hmm. And by uh, sound waves that go through uh, the capillaries in their wings and they have these little cones and they shoot out and it creates a, like a, a toroidal field around them. So they're like levitating. Well, wow. I have, I have heard that and that they can disconnect that too, so that they can, uh, we learned this, um, we had a beehive that got broken open, uh, Ooh. one winter. It wasn't, it wasn't a, it was a wild hive, but the tree fell and they had built a huge hive inside the tree. And we were trying to figure out how to protect them from the winter because right. it was middle of winter. They couldn't move anymore. And so they were completely like one whole ha- side of the hive was exposed. And uh, when we were reading about possible ways to protect them and maybe, you know, could we put blankets around it? How do we keep them warm? We were learning about how they keep the hive, hive warm uh, during the cold of the winter. And it, apparently they can disconnect the whatever it is that makes their wings move. Yeah, the linkage from the muscle to the wing. They can yeah. just and then they it. can just buzz the muscle and that make, that warms their body up and 
like overnight during the cold, there's a whole bunch of them that are assigned to just move around in the hive doing that. They're not flapping their wings, but they're buzzing those muscles and it makes their body hot and they'll move around in the hive to keep it warm. And, uh, we actually went out there at night <clears throat> with, uh, we had some night vision, like some, uh, infrared thermal, thermal goggles yeah. or thermal vision. And we watched and you could see there were some bees that were bright white in the infrared, meaning they're hot moving around. And then after a little while they would, they would stop moving and the bright white would fade and some other one would suddenly turn white and start moving around as they took turns keeping so the hive cool. warm. It was amazing to watch. And you could see the central wow. the central area of the, the cluster of bees was like much brighter than the, the outside. Because, and that's where they say the queen, the, the bees all cluster around the queen and they keep her warm. Yeah. Yep. It's, uh, it was really cool. A little to tangent see that. there, but yes, yeah. bees are really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and hot. <laughs> All right, so what's the next image here? So, yeah, we're going on the stamps. Is that what these are? What is? The... Yes. So this is a company out of um, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, called Rio Grande. And um, what they uh, – let's see. I lost my – okay. So they have an ultrasonic uh, machine, but they don't say that in their description. They just say blah, blah, blah. And But I can tell what they're using. They do use the word ultrasonic, but they also say we hand carve it. So it's a little misleading. But what you're looking at here is a metal stamp that went onto a, uh, an agate. Now, agate is um, also a silicate like quartz. It's, uh, agate is a micro cryptocrystalline quartz called chalcedony. When chalcedony has lines in it, we call it agate. If it doesn't have lines, then it's jasper. So these agates, a metal tube went right over it and they ground that right into it with the abrasive. And see, the uh -huh. agate has layers of uh, color. So you're just going through those layers. Wow. Now, if you had to hire someone in Germany to do that, it would cost you a fortune. This probably took them less than uh, six minutes. Wow. Okay, so what we're, yeah. what we're seeing on the screen is a, 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 a group of little, like, uh, most of them are circular. One of them is an oval. But there's, like, a compass rose. There's the zodiacal wheel, a uh, yin-yang, a sun figure, an anchor. And I don't know what the other one is. But uh, yeah, the fleur de lis or whatever that is, the yeah. Yeah. some yeah. kind of plant. Yeah, <laughs> and these but are uh, this is three dimensional. I mean, they're carving yeah. it uh, with high and low relief high all at relief. one time, yeah. and uh, the images are just coming up because the layer in back of it is uh, a, different, of a color. different relief. That is color. beautiful. That's uh, that's really awesome. Wow. So so what they're the way they're doing this is they make they they make either a mold and they cast it in with with a metal and then they put it on that mm -hmm. sonic tool and just press it down onto the stone. You got it, and that's it. And you'll be able to do that with your machine as well. We gotta have one. We gotta have one. <laughs> we, it's, but we're gonna call this machine the Shamir. Yeah. From now on. Yeah. <laughs> the Shamir. <Right. laughs> Is that what they're called? By the way, I'm just curious. They should be. We I should, think so. We should start our own company if they don't call it that. <laughs> that is awesome. Holy cow. Yeah. So the next picture is the machine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. So, so yeah. Did, okay. So we're we're looking at the machine. So kind of give us a description of what's going on here. What are we looking at? Okay. On the very top uh, is uh, the transducer that creates the vibration, and it goes down to. Um, uh, you can kind of see the metal horn mm -hmm. coming yep. down, mm -hmm. right? And uh, that I just screw on. You can see a, a loose uh, metal horn with a tool on it just below yeah. the lower left. So you screw that on there, and then on the right you can see. Uh, it's, uh, water comes down that tray and all your grit in there. I use a silicon carbide has about a hardness of like 9.2 or something like that. Um, and then that comes down and then the, once you, uh, there's a pedal below you and you press it and then the whole machine just starts to vibrate and you start cutting your stone. You just put the rock right under that tool and you do, I do it freehand. Okay. And the neat thing about it is I'm so nervous about spinning tools and stuff like that. This doesn't hurt you. You don't have to worry about diamond impregnated core drills, ripping through things. You can actually drill on the back of a stone by holding it. You couldn't do that with a, a spinning diamond wheel. Oh, it would just yeah. skip all over the place. Right. Yeah. Right. Wow. And it's really easy to use. Where the red button is, you just turn that sucker on, and the top knob, uh, you move it three quarters to the right, and the other one, you just slightly move it until you get to point two on the little graph, and boom, you're ready to go. So and it's the neat always thing about the same? This, right when you get to 18,000, um, 
uh, kilohertz, uh, it starts warming up hmm. the water. It starts getting hot. And uh, it kind of reminds me of something Michael Tellinger said, Tellinger said something about uh, the, all the things sound does. Sound creates DNA. Sound creates light. Sound yeah. uh, boils water. So, you know. Wow. It just, it's just something I thought of. Is oh, okay. I, so, so on a cold day, when I get to 18, I'm just excited because I know the water's going to warm up. <laughs> so that must be, that must be the key that you're, you're trying to get the frequency to a certain frequency that makes water agitate really rapidly. That's why the water's heating up. And that's why you keep, it's always the same frequency, no matter what the stone, because you're not worried about finding the frequency in the stone. Yeah, you want no, the water. No, to move. You're wanting the water to be agitated. At the, like exactly. you're finding the frequency of the water, basically. That's cool. Or the frequency to shake the tube. Uh, whatever goes in the tube's path is just gonna. That water is gonna draw that grit right down into where it needs to go, and then that vibration kind of holds it there. If you didn't use the um, water and the grit coming down, and you put it against a stone, it's gonna swish back and forth and just scatter everything. It won't do anything. Hmm. But it you're right. it needs the water and the grit. Hmm, man, super cool. So how do we get the grit if we get the machine? We're gonna have to. Oh, they'll send you uh, like a, a big pound of it, and you can get as much as you want at any time. Okay. Um, the gentleman that I spoke with before, he's not he hasn't been answering his phone since co the COVID thing. So, um, but I I found the phone number for you, so I think we're all good to go. All right. All right. Yeah. Post that in the show notes. There's another machine, but it, it makes up to a three millimeter hole. And I remember my father saying, he goes, Jeff, I know you. You better get the one that does a bigger hole. So <laughs> for a few hundred dollars more, it's worth the, to do this because then you're going to be able to stamp uh, like hieroglyphics in stone also. All right. So when you make a yeah. stamp, how, how big a round can the stamp be? Well, it tells you uh, on this, uh, like about 20 millimeters, uh, it's a different horn too. So the horn will change the frequency and so forth. And also when the tube is disintegrating, you know, when it's in a cutting action, the frequency is changing. So that's why I like this manual where you can slowly kind of keep it. The frequency is always changing the more you're drilling through something. Yeah, mm. that makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Fascinating. I can see doing a lot of science with this machine. Yeah. You, All right. Yes. Yeah. All right. The watcher's got us a link here to these, this place in Sicily. Um, let me see if I can share this on the screen here. I think you are sharing this. Or, no, uh, I'm not sharing, sharing this sharing yet. It. Okay. But I don't know if I can navigate through this. Well, you just got to, he said there's some pictures that are interesting on there. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we just could, like use the arrow keys. I want it to. Be bigger than bigger. That. Okay. I don't know. Uh, he said some pictures show the taper. Okay. There's a square hole in one of the columns there. Wow. That column is heavily eroded. Can you see what we're seeing? Oh, I yeah. can. And But we would never be able to ter determine how the square hole is made without seeing it in person. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Man, look at that thing. Yeah, like we went from time. eight inches in Egypt to what eight, ten feet or more. Yeah, yeah. that's an olive diameter. orchard too. It's sitting in. Yeah, it's sitting in an olive orchard. Uh, that's a lot of weathering and erosion on that piece. Yeah. Yeah, that one looks. And on here, I mean, it almost looks like um, the striations that you see um, that Petrie was always talking yeah, about. Yeah, they look like that, angled. I think that's the sedimentary. I, I think it's limestone sedimentary yeah. layers. I was wondering that too, if that's the sedimentary layers of the stone. But the angle, it's it does uh, look like sedimentary strata. Yeah. Yeah. It does look uh, suspiciously like it was. It, it looks tapered. Spiraling and tapered. Yeah. It it's, does. It, it looks fatter, fatter at, at the, the bottom. bottom. Yeah. That's hard to tell from a picture, too, though. Yeah, it can that's be deceiving. True. So, yeah, the place is called Cave de Cusa. Cuso or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Sicily. Yep. Wow. And there's some really good pictures on there. And then they show like a drawing of how they thought they did it. But they put these those knobs on the cores, but none of these uh, images will show knobs. Why did they put knobs on a cartoon picture? I don't get yeah. that. Yeah. Hmm. That's a different technology. Anyway. Huh. Well, we're going to have to look into this site go, more. Yeah. This, is, this is really interesting. So. Yeah. And Sicily is really close to Malta, I'm pretty sure. 
I mean, it's like mm -hmm. right across the water. Okay. From Malta, so I wonder if there if those that might be connected. That's where the giants are supposed to be from, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> somewhere yeah, out there. That's right. There's lots of weird you stuff. You need on a Malta. giant to use one of those big metal tubes. That's yeah. right. <laughs> there you go. Another mystery <laughs> solved. <laughs> that's right. All right, back to your your images here. So th this is now we're looking down mm -hmm. on some of the stones. This is it looks like amethyst, and uh, I don't. Yeah, know. Yeah, you got it. So amethyst hardness of seven, and it's piezoelectric. That vibrates thirty. 2,000 times a second. What I'm showing on in my hand is ground up of the rock straight below it, which is a silicon carbide. So it's person made, and then you grind it up. So I was just kind of showing the grit I'm using. Uh, okay, yeah, it's there. silicon carbide, yeah. in the, and you have a, like a solid piece of it. Yeah, so if you were to crush that up, it'd be uh, like what's in my hand. Okay. All right. Hmm. So you, you're saying, so stones that are piezoelectric all vibrate at that same frequency 32,000 times a second is that what you're saying well i know quartz does um um yeah so there's other stones and, and too so like amethyst is also piezoelectric quartz. but it's also um well it's piezoelectric and pyro meaning with heat it creates electrical charge hmm that yeah, they used to get like uh, tourmaline. They'd heat them up and get a rope and put it down a chimney and then bring the rope back up and it would collect all the dust and they called them chimney sweeps. So you get big chunks of swirl. When tourmaline's black, you call it swirl. And then you heat them up and they collect dust because the uh, like static electricity or whatever. It's ah. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> yeah. Really cool. But yeah, that's the neat thing is I remember going to school and in the text, I was never good at reading and stuff. I, I like hands-on stuff. And they would talk about piezoelectricity and so forth. And I remember I went back to the Gemological Institute of America and I did a seminar over there. And um, instead of explaining it, I just had everyone, I gave everyone a sample. And basically any quartz you find outside, just bring it in the house and go into the bathroom and turn all the lights off and strike it. Actually, give it a firm scrape. The inside will light up. And to prove it's not a spark, um, just fill the sink up with water, turn the lights off, and do it underwater, and it lights up underwater. So that way you can actually see piezoelectricity in action and not just read about it. And you wow. can do this with uh, agate, jasper. They all light up. Yep, that's right. Yep. And now aren't they jasper, amethysts? That's all a form of quartz, too. Isn't it? Correct. Right. So Fire, your amethyst yeah. is a crystal quartz, and then a micro or tiny crystals of quartz is your chalcedony, which is also jasper and agate combined. They're both of that what about, chalcedony uh, species. What about flint? That's Flint uh, has a probably a hardness of six, so it's a, a silicate also, so it's in that uh, category of chalcedony. So it's very similar, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's probably, a crypto yeah, crystal. In too. hardness, too. Yeah. Fascinating. All right. So here's a image of you. Like you, I guess you just cut a star hole there. Yeah. I was just, I, I wanted uh, that picture I just did this morning. I was, uh, you can see the uh, horns a little bit rusty. I didn't clean it, but I wanted to show how the water was coming out. And mm -hmm. then you just get that stone and you put it right under the tool and you can put your hand right under it and not worry about anything. And it just goes right through. But if you do touch the end of it, it gives you a sharp little pain. So I don't yeah. know what's up with that, but <laughs> you keep your hands away from that part. Yeah, it, sting, it stings you when you touch the end of it, but it doesn't it doesn't drill through you, basically. No. Yeah. It's just like a little pinch, and it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Made it through. <laughs> Made it through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't exactly. try that with a regular drill. Yeah. So it doesn't hurt at all. Yeah. It's just... All right. And so this, describe, what are we looking at here? Bunch of pieces. Um, because I was, you know, knowing that uh, ancient times they just used uh, nature, nature science. So everything with nature. So here on the uh, this large piece of it's probably what shale. No, I don't know. Anyway, on the corner, you will see uh, all those scoops. That was the one uh, on my blog. And I was trying to do scoops kind of like uh, the unfinished obelisk. Yeah. And uh, that was the one where. Uh, this is the gift I want to give to the person that uh, plugged me into you guys. All so, right. 
there's different areas that have uh, square holes, star holes, and then the areas that look like four mounds going up and down, I have magnets underneath it, and I have them all uh, lined up north-facing poles so that when you put um, this pencil right over where the pyramid is, it floats, so that dangles. And then the uh, <laughs> nail is just holding it. It's right in between the uh, mag- – it's like magnetic pillows and resting a tube right in between it. Uh, It'll go forward or backwards, and I'm holding it with a little pyramid. Wow. That is – that's so cool. <laughs> that is really cool. Yeah. Man, so whoever you are. You, you, <laughs> you could take it off, put it back on, and it, it floats there, and you can move it around. It wobbles and spins, and just – it'll stay there forever Wow. until you take it off. That's awesome. So the pyramid is it looks court it looks like quartz, right? Is that what that it is? It is. It's a quartz pyramid and it's got a star hole in the center. And then I got a, a little tiny drill, like 0.8 or a millimeter, and just did a whole bunch of little uh drills into it. And you can kind of see how they kind of taper too. Yeah. Yeah, and that's awesome. Well I'm jealous. I'm super Whoever jealous. That. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. <laughs> Yeah, so this is how amazing this machine is, is because it's one thing to drill into a very hard aggregate, but very soft materials are very delicate, especially in jewelry. You have like uh, pearl. This is a pearl, so it's made up of calcite, aragonite, and conchylin. The hardness is uh, no more than three because of the calcite. Um, And there's no way you could do that with a diamond drill. You would sit there with the diamond drill forever uh, trying to get sharp internal edges, and then you'd have to go in there with a, um, a diamond impregnated file and try to file it just right. Yeah. And the layers would come out from a spinning material. So it's just an ingenious way of you know putting art within art. So I have like gold beads within the hole in the pearl. Yeah. Um, yeah. So normally when people carve pearls, they have a rotating disc. And they're just carving. So what we can do today is make round curves, flowing curves, but we can't do geometrics. Only this does geometrics. Yeah. And so the you've got these star-shaped holes cut into these pearls, and the interior mm-hmm. of the pearl is polished already when the tool is done? It's already smooth? No, it's, it's not like a high polish. It, it's rough, but it's a, a very, very fine rough. So um, I should do some photomicrography where I take pictures of the inside. We can really analyze those up close. How would you... Uh, so have you looked at... Um, any of the polishing stuff that like we've been we've been talking about that with Ben on some of the, the episodes we've done with, with Ben from Uncharted X. Uh, the polishing of the granite, uh, these giant granite boxes in the Serapium or the mm-hmm. Serapium. So... Yeah. That's a really interesting uh, thing that people are wondering about is how how did they get this ridiculously high polish with no tool marks um, on the exteriors of these fine carvings that and they the made? And the interiors. Yeah. yeah, that's going to be a different tool, a different machine. So your cutting action, your fast cutting is always going to, I think, is ultrasonic yeah. coring. Because even in your square holes, you'll see a round um, uh, tube making a whole bunch. You know, they're just taking material away before they use another tool to shape it and so forth. But, yeah, I've seen those where in the Serapium. What are those, basalt or diorite or something like Not diorite, probably basalt. Yeah, and granite, yep. They're, yeah, they're hard. And um, yeah, the precision's amazing. And then you see all the chicken scratch on the outside, which yep. is done with a little chisel. Yeah. yeah. But the insides, the high relief, the low relief, the corners, I don't need a real fancy tool to tell me how flat those are. I mean, that's just glossy, the gloss. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're going to polish something of that hardness, you would go down different grits. That's how we would do it today. For polishing, you'd probably have to go with a, a finer grit and a softer material like a cerium oxide or something like that. That's how we do it, but it blows me away. So now I'm thinking about the interior corners uh, of those boxes. You know, they, they measured the what was the radius of the tool, right? Yeah. So if they technically could have taken a tiny radius sonic drill and drilled straight down... On all four corners. Yeah, but then how do you do the bottom? I have no idea. Corners. <laughs> well, so you can use a blunt tool. Uh, yeah. So you could just have a blunt or a round blunt. bit or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe they had a gigantic drill where they just 
drilled just the whole one giant thing square and then yeah, popped just... it out and then did the fine touch up work. Well, there you go. I don't know. How did that machine fit in the ser- serapium? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Because <laughs> they yeah. they cut the they cut they cut them down in there somehow. Because there are unfinished boxes in there, so <sighs> that know. doesn't make any sense. But that's beautiful uh, art. I mean, that is some great um, work. I mean, it's machined so beautifully. Yeah. But the scoop marks on the outsides for sure could have been done with the with the sonic yeah. technology, right? right? We 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 talked about yes. the scoop marks. The scoop marks are like. Like you imagine half of an egg or just a spoon scoop out of there uh, that seemed to have taken out a crack or some some flaw in the flaw. in the rock, or maybe a large crystal inclusion, something. Oh, you mean are we talking the obelisk? We're talking about the outside of the serapium box. Uh, the oh, those. Serap- yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. they've got they've like the. There, there are these strange scoops taken out of the outsides of the boxes. Like the interiors are very precise, but on the outside there are these weird, uh, like think of taking an ice cream scoop and just scooping some stone off of the off the top of the box. Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah, maybe, right. we, um, maybe, okay. we can pull, maybe we can pull up some pictures here. Well, we can take a break. I'll get one uh, after the break. Yeah, and we'll we we'll discuss it. All right, uh, it is break time. It is. All right, snacks we'll and be right jewelry. Back. back ladies and gentlemen brothers of the serpent podcast joined by jeffrey appling of appling jewelry and we're talking about uh the mysteries of stone working and the possibilities of them of ancient people using sonic drilling uh and before we move on to some other stuff that jeffrey wanted to talk about we're going to look at a uh, picture of the serapium boxes with him and talk about the scoop marks on the outsides of that so jeffrey can you see this picture Yes, I can. Um, yeah. Are those elliptical or how? I think so. Yeah, they're it, like Ben described them as like ice cream, like somebody took an ice cream scoop to the stone. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, I, well, I don't see any tube marks. Uh, I don't think it was a solid uh, piece. It, it looks definitely more like a scoop. Yeah. 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 And then on the side, uh, but you see on the side how there's this, it's kind of hard to see, but there's like large scoops taken out of the top down the right side of the of the lid there. Yeah. yeah. If you could imagine, yeah, just like a big wedge sound fiber, you could cut that yeah. with sound technology. Yeah, definitely. But we don't, I don't know. Yeah. See, I was imagining like when we were talking about a spoon tool on the end of your uh, sonic drill or whatever we're calling it, uh, Shamir. <laughs> uh, could you, mm-hmm. I mean, I'd be interested to know what results you get if you get some kind of curved spoon tool. Like, could you make a scoop like this out of a, out of a hard rock? Yeah, that, that was my dilemma thinking about the scoop. So I, I tried to look for any artifacts. It might be a curved type metal or something like that, but I don't know how the vibration is going to go on a curve. I, um, yeah. Yeah, and I wonder you know, if you I could just, you, if you could build one of these things that could be like a hand tool, like you know, because the one you have is right. sort of mounted. Like, but if you could hold something in your hand, maybe you could make scoop marks like that. If you could sort of you know, well, you could. If you look at NASA, they're they're doing that because they knew they were going to go to Mars, I guess, and uh, so they have a little handheld ultrasonic. Uh, that was one of the first images I ever saw online. Was NASA's little handheld thing? Oh, um, so yeah. How do you? Well, yeah. hey. Handheld sham There folks. you go. That's what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you can't run out into the into the into the wilderness with it and wield it like a lightsaber, <laughs> it's not really a sham oh. so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I agree. They had big ones in the shops, but you got to you got to be able to get out there and in, in the, on the mountain and cut stuff, cut whole temples right out of the rock with it. So right, yeah. it seems like a, a lot of the areas where the um, uh, the star holes are uh, seems to always have uh, some type of an energy line going through it. Mm. So uh, I don't know the correlation between that. 
That's interesting. So I'm still uh, researching magnetic uh, electromagnetism and ley lines and stuff like yeah, that in okay. California. All right. Well, should we get into the um, to the site you've been looking at in California? Yeah, and let's also look yeah. at some of his jewelry too. Like he's got some beautiful pictures here of the gems. I want to talk about that as well. Okay. What do you want? Or just go back. Yeah, up. just go. We'll start. But he could give us a little brief description of each one. They're really cool. Yeah. Well, we're looking at this one, this green one here. It's kind of a yeah. Let's. Oh, so it, it's just a, a close up under my microscope, and that's just granite mm. with a star hole in it. Okay. And the neat thing about it is, if you position that star tube right close to the edge of that, it would go within. You can make it within a quarter of a millimeter to the edge without disrupting the stone at all. Wow. So it's like a hot knife going through butter, basically. Wow. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to ask you. Um, I think in your blog you mentioned how the tool can become stuck if you turn off the sonic uh, vibration while right. the tool is inside the stone. It will become stuck in there like the sword in the stone. <laughs> exactly. And that's what happened to me. Uh, I let my foot off the pedal and it, it stopped the frequency and that thing got jammed in there. And you can't take it off with a hammer or anything. <laughs> so I pushed my foot back onto the pedal and reamped it and that thing sh popped off. It didn't just come off. It popped off. Mm. So I'm picturing a metal rod stuck in, you know, with ultrasonic and then release the frequency, jam it in there. And then if you apply the frequency back to it, it'll pop out. Yeah. That was, I loved the reference to the, to the sword, sword and the stone, stone when yeah. you were talking about that. Yeah. I was just like, Oh my God, right. this guy's figured it out. If you find the frequency, you too can be King. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> I did a terrible job reading that part. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to sing to the sword. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. man. <laughs> that was so cool. Yeah. Okay, Thank moving you. on. Um, so what are we looking at here? All right. So here's your two different types of uh, jade. The center one is a nephrite jade, and then the, um, the bracelet is a jadeite jade. Um, these are the uh, hard or toughest natural substances on Earth. Um, so the center is nephrite, which is a little harder than the jadeite. And so when I did, and let's uh, understand that what, what toughness is, it's the resistance to breaking. So they're very hard to break. Hardness is different. Hardness is the resistance to scratching, kind of like only a diamond can scratch mm. a diamond. Uh, okay. So we're talking about toughness here. So it's like fibrous um, or something. Uh, there you go. Yeah. So your uh, center one, which is uh, nephrite jade, it's interwoven links. So it's a little tougher, whereas the jadeite jade is interlocking links ah. on a microscopic level. Yeah. Wow. And yet you never cut, knew that. You cut so, triangles and squares out of it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> so the square that you see in there is one of uh, the first ones I did. The first uh, squares I did, and um, uh, I asked some like professional jade people and master jade carvers. I said, "Can you do a square hole perfect into uh, jade?" And they said, "Sure, no problem." And they said they would uh, get a round diamond drill and they would drill it out and then they would get tiny um, diamond ball burrs and spin those and uh, clean up some of the material. And then they would get um, an onglet, a uh, kind of like a, a fine file and go in there and kind of uh, sharpen it up. And I said, would it be perfect? And they said, pretty perfect if we go not too many millimeters into it. I said, well, what about doing a triangle? And they said, no, I can't do it. Because the angle of incidence is too much. You can't uh, get the file in there to make it even. Yeah. Um, so I said, well, can you do it kind of fairly good? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, how much would it cost? And he says, well, we charge $100 a day. And I said, well, how long is it going to take you? And he said, well, I don't know, 10, 14 days. Mm, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So um, anyway, that kind of, it was amazing. $1,400, you can buy the machine for that. So the I did... On the bracelet, I did uh, four millimeter triangle holes, and there's 11 of them, and I did it all in 20 minutes. Ah, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Right? That is amazing. So I guess this next one is a close-up of one of the triangle holes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. So you can see my tool is not all that uh, great. Like on the corner, it might have a little lip from um, when I was making the um, tool. So um, the better the tool maker, the better the hole. Yeah, and this is about pulling pulling the tube through or pulling some right. shape through the tube. Right. In jewelry, um, we uh, change the shape of wire by putting it through a draw plate, but we normally pull the wire. 
well, we have a tube. If I were to get pliers and try to clamp on that, I'm ruining my tube. So yeah. uh, I just push it. Instead of pulling it or drawing it, I hammer it through, mm. force it through. Okay. Yeah. Huh. So how do you get – I'm trying to figure out when you first – tried to put this round thing in the triangular hole. <laughs> <laughs> How does he get the end in there? You have to crimp the end down to get it to go start. Uh, say that again. Like, um, yeah, how do you get the triangle shape into the tube? Like when, it, you know, how do you first get the tube into the, to the triangle shape when you're trying to shape your tool? Yeah. Oh, you just hammer it. So I don't have a picture of it, but imagine a metal plate and it has different shapes in it. Right. Yeah. And you have a round tube and um, say uh, the metal shape, uh, it's a hole in metal. And um, we're going to uh, I, I have it on YouTube also where I demonstrate it. And I just get a, a hammer or a mallet and I pound that tube straight through the geometric hole. And it shapes that tube to this the same shape of the hole, the metal hole. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. I mean, I saw you do. I watched one of your videos where you did it. And uh, I was just wondering mm -hmm. how the how the very end of the tube, when you first put it there, doesn't just cr oh, crimp over. Yeah, so the plate is a little bit indented, so the uh -oh. round tube will will fit into it. Okay, so, so it's kind of locked in. That's a great question. The initial, I, I didn't catch on that. On your plate, the hole's tapered, like so that the round yeah. tube will fit in the first part of it. Right. Okay, okay yeah. Got it. That's, that's what we were trying to figure out, is yeah. how do you start? <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, I learned from a very <laughs> early age that you don't try to put the round thing in the <laughs> square <laughs> hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, what do we have here? Oh, so um, if you ever look at all my jewelry, a lot of people are just fascinated by it. It's been published in books and stuff like that. But out of all my achievements, I am more proud of this stone with the five-point star hole in a rubellite tourmaline from Minas Gerais, Brazil. This technology changes everything. We don't need prongs on a stone. You, you build the metal into the stone. You, you do everything different. Ah, uh. And uh, for me, that's just, it, to me, this is more exciting than any of the work I've done in my life. Wow. That, well, it changes everything. So Okay. I, I we'll don't have to know put enough. that in my jewelry and explain. I'm not a great communicator, but in my jewelry, I can kind of get the point across. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I think I understand what you're saying. You're talking about like how you, I don't know enough about jewelry to really understand, but I think I understand what you're saying because you can, sh you can make these shapes in the stone and you can put the metal in there. Uh, yep. Instead of prongs, just with... like key locks. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, <sighs> super cool. It is okay. And these, I mean, this is uh, what is what are we looking at here? Yeah. yeah. So this is under the microscope, looking at that. Uh, there's a large amethyst, a 440 karat amethyst quartz, uh, and I have one picture of it um, before the hole. So this is the holes inside of it, and you can kind of see if you look at the. Um, so you're driving a, um, a star-shaped tool through this. If you look on the star hole on the right side, see how the top is uneven? Yes. And it's not straight? But that's because my tool is uneven because parts of it were disintegrating. So whatever shape the end of the tool is, is going to leave the last impression within the stone ah. too. Yeah. And then how do you break off that core? Or did it just get stuck inside the... Yeah, it stays in there. And then to break it out, I uh, just get like a nail and just pop it out. So I have some images where I keep the core in. And the ones where I keep the core in, I put a uh, glow-in-the-dark powder in it, and I seal it off on the top oh. so all my stones glow in the dark. Genius. <laughs> God. No, that's crazy. It's awesome. That's that brilliant. <laughs> so that's what we're looking at. That's the... That same? was, uh, yeah, this is, uh, in the way, uh, this also took me 20 minutes. If you had to get a 440 carat amethyst with over 400 facets on it, and then have this artwork in the backside, you're going to be paying over $7,000. I bought this off the street in Tucson for 400 bucks and put the geometrics in 20 minutes. And now you got a $2,500 stone. Wow. So you can do this at home. You don't need to practice all this fancy stuff. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And that was it, uh, the amethyst. So oh, when this you was see the original uh, with stone? The holes, I had uh, some pretty lights in it kind of lighting it up. Yeah. Okay. That's why. So that's the original stone you cut the star through. That's that's what we're looking at? Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, this is a picture of one of your 
Yeah, this is my uh, Praktikta or the 3D Kachana, which you always see like stuff like configurations and ancient technology and stuff like that. So I'm playing around with that. Yeah. Uh, the center stone's actually uh, citrine uh, quartz. Uh, basically, when quartz is purple, you call it amethyst. If it's yellow or golden, you call it citrine. Um, what we did on the back of this stone, a friend of mine, Andrew uh, uh, Gulledge, he drilled the back of the stone. He put three drill holes in the back of the citrine. Within each drill hole, he injected or inserted it with a gemstone rod at a critical angle to internally reflect and refract gems within a gem like a kaleidoscope. So we're creating art internally with other gems with internal reflection and refraction. Yeah, it's it's an indescribable effect. It's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> We're going to put these in the show notes. Yes, they're going to be in the show okay, notes. Okay, yeah. so yeah, People for those of you getting yeah. mad, just, yeah. just look Don't at the Don't be mad, show. look at the show notes. Look at the show notes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. But can you imagine, instead of putting round gemstones in there, taking the cores out and putting those in there and yeah. having geometric stones within a, just keep the yeah. geometry yes. rolling. Keep it going. Yes, man. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I love this idea of just inserting these other stones inside the core hole. That's just, yeah. it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing the, what it does to the light. Awesome. Okay. This is my, uh, the four pillars of reality and, um, the center is amethyst and that was cut by John Dyer. He's one of the top uh, American cutters. I use the best cutters in the country. A lot of them are in America and then I got spinning uh, spheres on the side. And then the green stones are a uh, Savarite garnet from East Africa near Kenya and Tanzania. It's kind of the color what Emerald wishes it could be. <laughs> and then the blue, little blue stones you see in there, that's uh, Sapphire, which is an aluminum oxide called corundum. So when corundum is red, we call it Ruby. If it's any other color, it's Sapphire. Ah. So Sapphire can be other colors than other just blue. So it's basically trace elements that cause the color. What causes sapphire to be blue? That'd be iron and titanium. So mm-hmm. what causes sapphire to be yellow? That'd be nitrogen. So and just wow. fun with art. So what's the pattern in the central stone there? How did, how did that effect get? Okay. So um, John Dyer was using a flat lap faceting machine uh, for the top part there where you have flat facets. But on the back, I think he was using an Ultratech. I have Ultratech also, but I, I'm not set up to do concave or convex faceting. So that's what he's done. On some of the facet junctions along the back, uh, they're curved inward. So he's bending light, and he knows not to go past the critical angle of 43 degrees or else he'll create a window right through the thing. So oh. this, he's got everything so precision with this. And I just frame everything. Right. Man, that's awesome. It's mm-hmm. a beautiful piece. All right. And okay. So the center stone is a uh, blue topaz, and those little uh, disc, uh, disc patterns in there, just imagine a, uh, a spinning uh, diamond burr, like a ball impregnated with diamond spinning, yeah. and you just grind the back, and then you go over it and polish it with possibly cerium oxide, and you create those little... Uh, beautiful indentations that look like bubbles in water. Right. So creating art within stones, I think is just as important as the outside. And I, this one I call Gaia or mineral and water. Cause it's kind of like us as humans, we're, we're ground to this earth. We're made of mineral and water. So is our planet. So I was just trying to show the bubbles and I have white diamonds, blue diamonds. The green stones are the Savarite garnet from East Africa. So, All right. Yeah. Stuff. Enough of that. Don't gotta get, to gotta get one of these for my wife. <laughs> it's gonna happen. <laughs> okay, and now the pyramid. Yeah. So when I was looking in the queen's chamber, I saw a square hole. I don't know if that was done sonically, but I thought, oh gosh, I'll just go ahead and use a triangle, and I'll just go in a little bit one direction, and then a little bit the other, and there you go. Uh, yeah. I have magnetic little beads kind of going through it, showing how it goes around like that. All right. So, it's yeah, the, the 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 shafts in the queen's chamber are interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. They never came all the way out into the chamber. This is something we puzzled over quite a bit on our show. They've been chiseled out since uh, I think they were chiseled out in the late eighteen hundreds, maybe the early nineteen hundreds. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the king's chamber, they did come all the way out into the chamber. Those square shafts they came all the way out into the chamber, like through through like through the core of the pyramid blocks down in and then through the granite walls of the chamber and out into the chamber. Nice. <laughs> right. And it's, 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 and those, those shafts go all the way out to the exterior of the pyramid in the queen's chamber. Beautiful. 
Yeah, in the Queen's Chamber, they have this. Uh, there are shafts, but whoever built the pyramid did not make them come all the way into the chamber. They ended uh, like six inches before the out before the interior part of the granite wall. So they cut those right. shafts all the way through the core of the pyramid for however hundreds of meters, and then ended it right there, and never brought them all the way into the chamber. And it's still... and never took them all the way out. Yeah, the they don't exit either. the pyramid anywhere either. Uh, a big mystery there. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so now we can move on to uh, yes. this other place. All right. Oh, the so key um, of Capistrano. When you're looking, for, well, for me, just watching uh, different uh, videos and stuff on YouTube, and you you know how they go through like forests and stuff like that, and they use line R, and you can start seeing our past structures are like basements today. I mean, all yes. you can, the only thing left of them is like the structure, the outline of it. Right. In this image, if you look straight down, it looks like a cross. Yep. Or almost like a key. Yes. Right? It does. Well, this is in this is the mission in San uh, Juan Capistrano, and that's what I'm looking for is these images because it's an image I saw of Masonic symbolism, and mm. so I went to this, and uh, when I and that's where I found all this uh, ancient um, well I don't know ancient I can say machine technology and volcanic tuff and all the text and the it doesn't match anything from the text. This is machined uh, stuff that, you know, I can explain the stamping in a hieroglyph, but I can't explain this place. It's, it's very difficult and very advanced. And it's covered by um, sandstone, adobe. So uh, sometime it was built over by our uh, Franciscan missionaries and the natives. They were putting lower quality, just like the Incas do over older structures. Mm. The same was done here. Yeah. Yeah, so you have an image of it there. Yeah. So here, if you look at the beautiful column uh, that's kind of in the center, well, that's kind of the shape of the, the what the pillar was at one time, a uh, volcanic tuff. Uh, but that this is all repurposed. They went in there with millions of dollars and tried to make it look like it was before. Uh. And so what I want people to focus on is the, the advanced engineering. Don't look at the wall. Don't look at all the dirt in between it. Um, what we're, yeah, that uh, stucco, that's recent. Right. Just, recent and then if you see red brick that was i don't know introduced that was from russia introduced 1850 in san francisco probably 1850 so that was added much longer but if you look at it looks like ribs coming out of the um stone there yeah those yes. those breaks are just like the breaks you see in uh big volcanic tuff uh, obelisks in ethiopia the the fracture is the same on the opposite side of that wall is another wall in another fracture so it looks like something came right through there and that's where it snapped oh yeah mm. <coughs> all right let's see Oh, uh, this is one of the uh, doorways away from the uh, uh, mission, or away from the Rock Church. They have there's doorways all over, and you can't see hardly any of the, anything because they cover it with all this dried mud, adobe, and mm. stuff. This is a friend of mine, Alan. He's standing for uh, scale, and this is all like uh, uh, different sized blocks that were all uh, assembled together. And that center flower that's in that floral piece. It's high and low relief, and it's precision. And yeah, those wall. Like, I mean, look at the indentations into yeah, the the amazing. door with those deep indentations. That's the key. And then stone. down, yeah, there's the um, floral design. Yeah. And there seems to be coating in this too. Like on the bottom, you see three. I see. Um, it. Yeah. Loops. It reminds me of the same distance of like uh, Gobekli Tepe when they have those oh, like yeah. purses, yeah. but they're not. And then on the left side, there's like five. And then on the right, there's four. And so Yeah, forth. you're right. So what I did is I said, okay, we can't chisel that with chip. I've already tried doing all that. So I had my buddy, I said, hey, can you see and see some of uh, the stuff? And, you know, there's no real good schooling on this. So he had to learn a lot by himself, uh, very expensive software. So he had a CNC machine and it's like a rotating um, silicon carbide drill. And just by computer software, it goes and outlines all this stuff, mm -hmm. the high and low relief it takes forever. And uh, so he was able to do it out of this foam and we're going to do it in volcanic tuff to show how it's done by CNC and uh, uh, kind of go from there. 
So okay, I'm so working on a documentary a, too. A foam. But here I'm showing some of the tools. You know, <clears throat> we can go into wood, make geometric, but this is done so intricately, and it goes like four inches down into the center. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so because so because of your experience working with stone, you can look at that and say they didn't chisel that. Basically, is what you're. Oh yeah. At. Okay. But I thought for when you uh, teach people, it's better to show them that, so yes. it makes a little more sense. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Wow. And it looks all messy now because they keep putting like they try Plaster. to repair it and stuff like that. The only thing that's holding these together right now, they, they didn't use cement in these. So on that foam block that I had Gary make for me, this whole block, that center keystone block goes back like a foot. Uh -huh. So you had to saw that. And then the blocks on the side, some are bigger, some are lower, but they're all perfectly carved within the blocks. And today they have, look at all the nails holding everything together. At one time, there was no nails holding this. There was no cement, no mortar. Mm. Yeah, I do see the nails sticking out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they were. And they're holding the whole big temple with like big metal rods. It's because of all that weight of the uh, dried mud and the adobe is putting that stress on the, uh, uh. the framework of the skeletal structure of the carved tuff. Hmm. Oh, I, can't, I, can't, I think this was the other side of the archway that you were talking yes, about where it was broken right. off. Okay. So here you see these enigmatic uh, arches, you know, triple arch. And um, yeah, so you, right where, yeah, that's all the conglomerate. That's sandstone and just, just different things. Very poor construction. Yeah. It's nothing like what those uh, pillars and arches are made of. And that, there was some big catastrophe. You can see where the break is on the uh top of the rib in that top piece up yeah high. yeah right and you're right it does it does look like different construction the fill for that arch is not the same as the arch itself or the column mm -hmm. it's just filled in yeah looks like yeah and then even like where those pillars are in the lower corner uh there's polygonal blocks in there so there's more than four sides and no cement now when they spent millions of dollars uh uh making the parade, uh, trying to fix everything up. They filled any crack that could be put cement in there and they put little rocks and they put little chips of obsidian to make it look primitive. But if you were to take their little touch up out, this is like, you couldn't put a sheet of paper through that stuff. Ah. It's amazing. Hmm. Wow. So you're thinking that the, the rough stone work was done much later than this real fine pillars and stuff on the, on the outside. Yeah. And there's areas around the place where you can look at where waters come through and eroded the bottoms of some of the doorways much more. And, Is that what you're showing um, up here? Let's see. There's a picture of you. Up I don't know if I have one of those. This here? Or that's uh, a no. repair. Well, this is our, um, that's me. Uh, so see where my hand is that's our ability to touch this up so they're just using plaster and they're trying to make it look like what it might have looked at one time uh -huh. but no one carves volcanic tuff i mean the romans used it to make cement but they didn't carve big blocks of it and do polygonal work yeah um, huh. so they've touched it up with plaster here that's yeah that's about and it's horribly done <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're right it's just wrong yeah <laughs> so I'm sorry if I'm jumping through these out of order because I no, don't know I love what it. order they're supposed to be in. <laughs> so this is right when you come to San Juan Capistrano. When you first walk in to this cross, that's what you see is these giant three uh, arches. And then inside, uh, remember, at one time, this was all volcanic tuff carved. I, in, remove all the ugly uh, little dirty rock and the red brick and just imagine those pillars and how yeah. perfect they were. Inside that uh, temple behind the wall are like paintings that are green. It's amazing. There's artwork inside there that's hidden. That is just unbelievable. Hmm. And then um, also in the center on the very top is uh, what I use my logo for um, jewelry of the gods and it's a keystone and I have a close up later on it. Um, yeah, I was going to say yeah, that, right that up there. That's ceiling. And then if you get what I love about today's technology, you can take a picture of it, take it home on your computer and blow it up and get real close. Yeah. And I showed right to the left of that center keystone. I, I showed it to eight different people. I said, what do you see in that? And they said, oh, it looks like a, a ram, a carved uh, ram. There's like little carvings up in those uh, high beam bricks. Here you're showing, see the metal wire? They're trying to hold the whole place up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> metal rods yeah 
I'm trying right. to find the, the close up picture of the keystone. Is this, that's not it, is it? No, it'll be green. Okay. Uh, and the green material oh. is not anything used by uh, the natives. When I look at that, that's inlay work. Yeah. That's, Native Americans used to do that with their, yeah, that's, uh, that's a rendition right there. Uh, I believe his name was Randolph F. Miller. In around 1930 to 1935, he was uh, drawing images of the inside of the church, and these are available for sale, I think. But uh. he kind of shows how much precision was done on those scoops coming to the side of the green you see in there. Yeah. If you go around all the um, machine volcanic tuff, you'll see a lot of precision areas, and it's gone through, it looks like, thousands of years of weathering and erosion. Yes. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, that is a really interesting carving. Yeah, right there. That's uh, the green to the stone that is uh, like inlay, where you cut it all at one time. Now, in the upper left of the green bar on the left, you'll see a different color. It's uh, also it looks like a translucent material, and it has kind of a granular to conchoidal fracture. So I'm not sure what that material is. Mm. Um, yeah. Emerald tablets hidden. Uh, yeah. <laughs> something something secret here there are secrets here yeah that that yeah. now the carving that the carving you see in the center that is not machine that that could be done with a chisel it's okay. very um not perfect so okay i don't know but it yeah. doesn't it looks it does look native american like you say yeah, i mean that that style is uh mm -hmm. i don't know I don't, I don't recognize it from you know uh, cathedrals or missions that doesn't is the t okay watchers asking if the tuff is local to the area the volcanic tuff the where do they get the stone from oh i don't know uh you can get it i want to get a piece when i have uh, gary cnc it i'm gonna get a you don't want to use sandstones there's quartz and sandstone you'll ruin your uh, bit so volcanic tuff is good you could we have devil's post pile but that's more of basaltic so i'd say crowley lake and there's these beautiful columns. What happened was we built a dam back somewhere in the 1960s, uh, and it just built a lake. And then over time, the water was sloshing off one side, and the winds were ripping and tearing up the side. And it uncovered underneath the silt all these beautiful volcanic tubes in Crowley Lake. It's beautiful. Wow. And uh, you can get uh, volcanic tuff from there. How far away and is that? And also from Bishop. How far? Okay, so how far away are those sites from this? From this? Very far, very more far. than five hundred miles. Oh wow! Well, <laughs> I mean that's standard for ancient people, though. You know, five hundred miles. Not they don't blink at that. They're trying to get. Yeah, it's more in the Mammoth area of California. Yeah. Um, Still, yeah. it's interesting if they're using volcanic tuff to build these columns and things, but it there there isn't really a local source. That's a very interesting right. problem. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Look at all this stuff. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I love this. This is like uh, when you first walk in, look into the temple, uh, on the left, you'll see uh, a nine foot inside doorway, which is not shown in this picture, but right to the geometrics coming down, there's a block. Um, right above, uh, go to a little bit to your right, a little to the left, and then up that block right there, right there. Yeah. That is got, that's polygonal. Yes. Oh, okay. And I there's more, and it's just beautiful work. And I have an old picture of it. It's, it's these things have never changed. Uh, even when there's an earthquake, all the rubble falls. The only thing that stands up is this um, advanced machining yeah. work. Makes sense. Yeah, all that crappy work falls away, mm -hmm. and this stuff stays. I up. mean, polygonal blocks that will create anti-earthquake, but it can't necessarily ca uh, stop a cataclysm or a force from the side. Right. Right. So, yeah. uh, you know, you see that in Puma Punku, for example. Mm. Um, but also erosion. I mean, it's it's susceptible to erosive uh, work as well. Yeah. Mm. Um, so what what's this? Yeah, this is a much older picture. So oh, that was you can what see we were that same block at. where the water is kind of outlining it a little more. Now, th these uh, doorways or these volcanic uh, tough carved blocks are used with no cement. They're just stacked in there, and they're not all the same size. They have different, but the carving is the same. And then the emblems, like on this one, there's a sun emblem on the top, whereas the opposite side looks like a bow tie. None of these symbols are anything in Catholicism, nothing in the, with the Franciscan missionaries. I don't know anything with Native Americans that had these uh, geometries. Mm. But until I interview someone that knows past history, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, what I think about this is why on a beautiful nine-foot inside diameter, the 
I think it's 11 feet all the way to the top of this uh, arch. Why would you block it off with red brick? Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, doorways you go through, you don't block them off and make walls. Well, they made walls with this whole place. They just used a previous structure as like the wood beams and they just tried to build their uh, dirt yeah, on it. That makes sense. Huh. I know. Yeah. I know someone who's going to love this part of this episode. <laughs> mm. This is great. Wow. Really interesting. So yeah, that's that's so what this picture we were looking at before, that's just one column of that doorway there. Yes. You can see the same yes. design. Uh -huh. And there's that polygonal block, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. A watcher says the foundation is seven feet thick, apparently. Wow. Of this place. Yeah. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's tunnels underneath it too. Uh -huh. And people, you just like Google like stories, get people out there and research it, and you're going to find out a lot of unique things. Yeah. This is the uh, nine foot door on the right hand side. And, yeah, much, um, much, a little bit better um, shape. Yeah. But again, blocked off. Yeah, that is strange. That's why wild. they did that? All right. Well, we are up on yeah. another break. Yeah. So we'll, we'll come back in a little bit and wrap it up. Wrap folks. it up. back for the final segment of the final hour of our vacation podcast. <laughs> well, it's not really a vacation. It's not a vacation. Our uh, Contact the Cabin tour getaway podcast Yeah, with uh, Jeffrey Appling. And uh, man, you've brought a lot of very interesting stuff to the table. Um, I really appreciate it. I think this, this sonic drilling has totally uh, changed my mind. I would love to get one of those machines and I, I, it's it's interesting looking at the at the different some of these different sites with you and talking about them and you're like oh yeah that's that's not sonic drilling because I totally would have been <laughs> you know like that's what they're doing there yeah. but yeah you got to get the I, tool you have to work with the tool and you start to realize like this is what the what it looks like this is how it would work and you can it's obvious that you've you've got that keen eye developed from using and working with the stone and that's that's really great. So uh, we really appreciate you bringing your knowledge yeah. and sharing it with us. Oh, it's a blessing to be able to share this, too. And, get, and thank you for giving me a platform and a chance. So I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, man, no problem. Oh, okay, yeah, GMA says he's just going to come use our machine. He's, he's not going to get one. He's just going to come use ours. <laughs> so I want to go back to like a little more, you know, maybe a bit more speculation here to wrap up. But um, uh how could you could you use some technology like this to like flat like for example flatten those puffy walls you see in Peru? You know what I'm talking about? Like if you wanted to make them flat, the surface part well, flat. Probably what you were probably thinking in your head is just having like a, a straight shovel type come straight down and yeah. just slice it off, like right. you're slicing cheese with a wire. Yeah. Um. Uh, but I don't know. That's one idea, but I. Mm, I, some of that stuff looks so odd. It's like growing puffy and it's like it was resonated and then froze and just so many different things going on. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean, there, you know, there's plenty of theories people have about softening the stone because it does look like, I mean, you mentioned like putting a, running a wire through jello. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a great description of what some of those walls look like. Uh, but yeah, it, do, it does look like, you know, I mean, softening stone, there's people who think that maybe some of it was geopolymer. But on the other hand, right. you know, we've uh -huh. gone through with Ben on some of these and you see the same, like they, like one of the ideas is that the little nubs that stick out of some of those blocks were the injection ports um, it, when they were, you know, like basically injecting geopolymer into a mold. Uh, but you see those same nubs on mountain walls where they had been cut flat and then they left these nubs sticking out and it's just, it's just the mountain. It's like they were quarrying the rock out of there and yet these nubs are sticking out. So the, I don't know about geopolymer. Uh, possibly some of it is that, 
And I agree with you. It has kind of a, a flow or a poor structure. Um, yeah. Mm. I'm not, I'm trying to imagine the, you know, the, the polygonal construction. If you had a set of tools or, uh, you know, tool shapes, basically you're building the wall based on the shape of the tool, right? So you could right. actually cut those blocks out in the random strange mm. shapes that they're at and they would be very well machined sides yeah the faces of the rock could be finished in a different way to make the pillow okay form right but you're you're you take a tool so the rocks are basically the cores of a cut. the rocks are the cores of cuts okay. with this sonic drilling and the each tool like what if they had thousands of tools mm -hmm. and they were all designed and numbered to where they knew it's like cut it Cut it with the first tool. That's rock one. The second tool goes on the top. This one goes the, yeah. where they could just create this pattern. Yep. That, mm, that awesome. makes more sense. Yes. That does make sense. And then they and then I don't know how they finish the faces of them, but how they get them to look like that. They they sandblasted them with diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> So yeah, is there so he, does does the well, we we talked about this a little bit when we were looking at the pearls, but we were asking about what kind of what pattern does this tool leave on stones when you cut it? Is it does it does it leave striations on the interiors okay. of, the, of the cuts? Yeah, I do notice under a microscope um, on some of it there is like those the it's not. I do see little ripples, but I don't know if that's from putting the stone up and down with water pushing it. You'll feel a little bit of movement. And every time you move uh, that uh, stone up and down, you're creating, you know, you're drilling, not drilling, drilling, not drilling. And then um, possibly, or if you're moving the tube in a circular direction, is it carving that? So um, I would like to look under the microscope because my grit is very fine. So maybe we're just getting a very smooth uh, core and hole, but I'd like to look under the microscope, get it up to about 65 power. And let's look between on the granite between the uh, quartz felspar and mica and, and see and measure those somehow. So yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. I and can also, work on that. Also, if it was being pulsed, um, you know, if it, if it was a machine and so like with your machine, you're holding the stone in your hand. So your hand, is taking the place of what could be a machine driving the tool, and so if there was a if there was a rhythm to the to a, a machine that's driving that tool down into the stone instead of the stone moving towards the tool, you right. could end that up with that would make more sense. You lay out an obelisk and you uh, bring that tool straight down, and you make a nice imprint. Because those obelisks, I mean, obelisks are so perfect. I mean, they're, they're going to do everything in perfection. They won't do that freehand, I doubt. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, I see that. Hmm. Yeah, and like the, you know, the, so Christopher Dunn studied that one drill core and they measured those, the striations on it. And they are, that's the w weird thing about it is that they are a spiral. They do, they're like threads of a screw going down. So it's as though the tool end of the sonic, like if it was a sonic drill, that tool would have to be rotating as well as plunging down mm -hmm. into the stone, right? It could be going. And that was my thought too. And that's what, without seeing the piece in person, it's just like a gemologist. Um, uh, if you show me a gemstone and I tell you what it is, I'm incompetent. You have to do all your tests. You have to physically inspect it. Yes. And, but from that, it, that's exactly what I was thinking. Kind of, yeah. You know. Yeah, and the watcher says that the that core has a 0.1 inch feed rate. So nobody can figure out how you can make a tool that narrow with that narrow of a wall that was sharp enough and had enough pressure on it pushing down to just turn and grind down into the the granite at that at that rate. But if it was utilizing sonic resonance and You're also turning, yeah. yeah, you can, you can get the, you can move, get that feed rate, but it, the tool is also turning. So you end up with the striations. And then what would have the, right. what would, what would cause those striations? Like would be the bottom of the tool have teeth? I, I don't know. No, I was just No, saying, it, it, it could be completely smooth. It's just, uh, when the tube's going down and turning, it's cutting material. So it's kind of like a record player. 
Oh. And as it's spinning. So you can spin that uh, tube too and drill. It might be even a faster, I'd say it probably maybe a faster action too. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the watcher is suggesting it might've been a wobble in the feed. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The, an imperfect. Well, that would be another way. Like if you're making a round tube, like you were talking about making your tool ends and how they're not perfect. So if they had a round tube, but the tube was not perfectly round, but they needed a really perfectly round core, the best way to do it would be to spin that spin the tube. tube that's imperfect, and you would end up with a round core. Yep. Hmm. Right? Because the imperfection would still be... It, it would be would, spread out. It would be spread out all the yeah. way across and make it hmm. make it circular. So, I don't know. I think... I just... I think you're on to something for yeah. sure. Like, I think this is, yeah, it's, we, it's, there's a lot of similarities. Yes. Yeah. So it's yep. amazing that this is not, uh, really just part of the mainstream idea. Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe it's really hard to get that high frequency resonance. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can't give ancient butt flap people of ultrasonic drill. Can't give them a sham air. Huh? I mean, they're not even allowed to have iron. Like, can't give them an ultrasonic drill. They could have done it with copper. <laughs> yeah, but you got to build the rest of the machine. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's what blows me away. I try not to think of how it was done. I just try to see, or I mean, who or what the equipment was. I just try to look at different patterns. Right, yeah. You're looking at what Dunn calls them witness marks. You're looking at the tool mm, marks yes. in the stone, and you're saying, okay, I recognize this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. Uh and so we're talking about these cores and we're talking about the striations and we're talking about possibilities. And, you know, none of us know how these ancient people did it or who these ancient people were or when they did it or what their machines were. But it, it's still it's you're on to something here. And I think this is even if <clears throat> this particular machine or even maybe possibly the techniques you're using aren't necessarily the techniques that they used it, there's something in common. Right. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I think that's the key. And that's kind of what we're trying to get across with this show and with talking to you, because the first time Kyle and I looked at your, your blog post with the photos, we were like, yeah, okay, we got to talk to this guy. <laughs> because, oh, cool. Because that's, <laughs> I was really scared that no one's reading any, or I, I was almost about to give up. No. So, um, never yeah. give up. <laughs> uh, no, I'm re-energized. I'm like, yeah, warp yeah. speed. Yeah, good. Because this is, it's, I think it's great. I love the work that you're doing. Uh, of course, the jewelry you make is beautiful, but it's really, you know, delving into the possibilities of matching witness marks, the tool marks that you're getting that look similar to some of this stuff we see in Ancient Stone is really important because, you know, when you've, we've followed, you know, we look at Petrie's work and Petrie, like, looked at that core before Chris Dunn did, you know, in the in the early 1900s or whatever, and he doesn't know what he's looking at either. You know, he was talking about mounted jewel tip cutting tools. Uh, so it's interesting because you can kind of, we can sit now and look back on the research that has been done at some of these sites like Egypt, where people have been researching it for hundreds of years. And you can see that as, as modern civilization's technology has advanced, more things have become apparent about the work that has been in Egypt for thousands of years yes. that earlier researchers couldn't see because they didn't have the machines yet to show them those kinds of marks, right? And so what you're doing, yeah. what you're doing is revealing another step of that with your work, and that's what's really important, and that's why we have you on the show. Oh, I thank you very much. Yeah, just baby steps. We'll get there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> baby steps, and we'll get there. Yeah. So... uh Unless, unless you got anything else, I was going to tell you, uh, plug, plug, uh, yeah. your, your jewelry and all that. Oh. Tell us where people can uh, find you. So I don't have a store anymore. Eventually I'll have a website, uh, that has a, a shopping store, but for now it's just appling jewelry. That's a P P L I N G jewelry, uh, dot com. And my name is Jeffrey appling. And, um, yeah, if you ever have any questions about this stuff, feel free to email me at Jeffrey appling, then the number one at gmail.com. And I'm so honored to be here and, and just this information get out and just be explored and argued. So, All right, man. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a, thanks uh, a million, buddy. Hopefully the Snake Force will be buying jewelry from you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I know I'm going to get some. All right. Talk to you soon. <laughs> All right, man. Thank right, you thank so much. You. Uh, you bet. Bye. All right. Yeah. Man, that was... Uh, 
Fantastic. Yes, that was that was amazing. I'm so glad he uh, got back to us. Yeah, and I did find the original comment on the website. So whoever the the snuggler eighty nine is, <laughs> you need to get a, you need to send us an email. Yeah. <laughs> The Snuggler 89. The snuggler, or I'm sorry, the Snuggler 83. Oh, 83. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Oh, man. Uh, but yeah, maybe I can <laughs> track this. Send for, us an email yeah. to the brothers of the servant at gmail.com. That's right, because you have a gift from Jeffrey. And it's awesome. A gift that I am very jealous of. <laughs> like, hey, maybe we can't find this person and you can just send that to us. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we're not going to do that. <laughs> Very cool. So yeah, that's cool. It's like he's a an award winning jewelry maker, and he started getting into this stuff, and now he's looking at ancient shit. Now he's listening to our podcast. And he's like, holy crap, he's like a snake bro. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we were trying to get in touch with him from when we first got that first link because Kyle and I went and looked at the blog, and we were just like, wow. And then we start bringing it up on the swap cast with Ben because we're like, dude, this guy's making scoop marks just like that, and and then he gets on the show and he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> not like those. <laughs> that was not sounding good. <laughs> but the stamps, holy crap! I know that was. That's the other thing. That one blew my mind. Uh, why isn't our? Why isn't our? I don't know. Sound. Was... We couldn't use any sound effects. I was trying to push the bl- mind blowing button the, <laughs> the whole time. It's not working. It's not working. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mind blown. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, sorry, the last segment there, or the th- third segment there, we were talking a lot about pictures, but I will put the pictures in the show notes. Some of them are small, but he sent us about 40 something, 40 something images. I'll put them all in the show notes so you guys can check out what we were talking about, and they'll be in there in the order that they were in the show. But basically, Kyle screwed it up pretty bad. At the yeah, I really screwed it up <laughs> when we started looking at the site. He would start talking about something at that site, and I would be scrolling through him like, okay, I think he's talking about this, and I'd <laughs> click on a different picture. But <laughs> Just go through them one at a time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Rookie move. Not a slideshow like, I was person. like, what is the slideshow guy doing here? <laughs> <laughs> a huge mistake. <laughs> I'll be better next time. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're going to call it on this one. Uh, it's a little short, but I think you guys will be okay It's with that. better than no show while we're out of town. That's right. And we might do a road soak. Yeah. I'm bringing the equipment. We're taking the equipment. no promises. No promises. That's right. It's going to be pretty packed. Yeah. So. All right, well, you guys can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. And please, Snuggler, get, a, get in touch with us so we can put you in touch with Jeffrey. And uh, check out the website, brothersoftheserpent.com. It's got the encyclopedia, the glossary, and the snakeskins, which is our merchandise store, including the new stuff that, that uh, Jeff has been making, which is, includes the Johnson shirt, which everyone needs to have to wear to work. It's got the Johnson <laughs> name tag on the front and the Brothers of the Servant logo on the back. <laughs> it's freaking perfect. I need that freaking shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, thanks to Jeff. Thanks to History Shift. And uh, everybody in the Discord and all of you Snake Force out there, we love you guys. Always have. Always will. Of course we will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work.